God is so good. Amen. Yeah. Somebody walked up to me and they said, I feel like we just touched heaven. Mm. There's more of it coming. We just got to stay out of the way. Father, I pray in the name and the blood of Jesus that I would not be seen nor heard, but you alone, Father, would be seen and heard throughout my entire life. I'm no good without you. I've got nothing, I've got nothing to point at and smile about if it were not for you, because any good thing I've been given, it's because you've allowed it and you've provided it. I thank you for the freedom in this room. Let me tell you, church, if you're here today and you feel something heavy, it's because you bought it in with you. <laughs> I want to encourage you, man. That's not, that's not a hit at you. I'm just being honest with you. There's such a freedom in this place that if you can't feel it, I want to tell you in love that God, God has provided freedom for you in every moment don't be held down by something that you're not supposed to be held down by there's such a sweetness here there's such a freedom and a lightness in this room the opportunities for us today are endless because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us God I'm thankful I thank you for these people, and I pray that our hearts and our ears and our eyes and our minds, that we would be tuned in and attentive and ready to receive whatever you have for us, individually and as a family, in Jesus' name and blood. In Jesus' name and blood. Everybody said, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's so good. God is good. Since the start of this new year, we have been studying together in the book of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, he has come back to the promises of God. He is, along with the people, rebuilding the walls and the gates of Jerusalem that were lying in ruins. The building process is going great. So many people are, are helping, not everybody, but a lot of people. We studied that last week. The people can, can see the progress. Everybody say, but then. And this is important to understand. But then something happens. But then something happens that should be expected. And listen to me on this. There is opposition to the work from the enemy. Pay close attention. Listen to me carefully. When you are striving towards your goals, when you're pushing and pressing towards your dreams, when you're going towards attaining the visions for your life, when you begin serving in your church and growing in your walk with God, be on the lookout. Because when the enemy sees you, and I promise you this, when the enemy sees you trusting in God for those things, when the enemy sees you honoring God with your life, get ready for a moment of opposition. Now, how long that season lasts is up to you. I've seen the enemy attack a man or woman, and I've seen them get over it almost momentarily. I've seen the same enemy attack someone else with the same thing, and it takes that person weeks or months to get over. And I've seen the enemy attack another believer with the same thing, and it's taken years plus to get over. The season is up to you. How long you occupy in it, how long you choose to dwell under the attack, listen closely, that's your business. See, because I serve a God 
that the Bible tells me that the enemy that comes up against me today has already been defeated. Can anybody say amen? The Bible tells me that he's already been stripped from the abilities that he has to defeat me. So if he can't beat me, I win. How many people in this room that you honestly in your faith know that with Jesus Christ all things are possible and you win every time against the enemy? So however long we choose to stay in the ring, that's on us. I've had people use this excuse of this thing called seasons, and they'll, they'll use the, the excuse of this thing called storms. And See, I serve a God that silent storms. I serve a God that controls the wind and the sea and the rain. I think as Christians, we cause it to rain on our lives more than it has to. I think as Christians, we create our own storms. We create our own weather patterns, if you will, and we allow our minds to take us into depression or fear or anxieties that, by the way, my God calls me out of. Oh, but we'll make an excuse and say it's a season. If God's against anxiety, why would he put me in a season of anxiety? If my God is against anger in my life, ungodly, unrighteous anger, and he's against fear in my life, then why would I conjure up an excuse of this word, season? See, pay attention to the word play I'm getting ready to use, because I feel this is from the Spirit. Rather than be in seasons, I think God is looking for Christians to be seasoned. Oftentimes, we don't get seasoned because we play with too many seasons. Do you see the difference? And as long as we're bouncing from season to season, how will we ever expect to get seasoned? See, because my Bible tells me that my God is coming back looking for a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Not Christians struggling with seasons. He's looking for a seasoned believer. He's looking for a seasoned bride. He's looking for a seasoned church. See, do we go through storms? Do we go through trials? Do we go through tribulations? Yes, they will come. We're going to see that in a moment through Scripture. I'm not saying that life is going to be perfect. I just warned you that when you step into perfection, the enemy comes with opposition. But when we get into that moment of storm or trial or season, whatever you want to call it, we better make sure, write this down, I'm going from season to seasoned. I don't want to be so long in my season that I take away my ability to be seasoned. I don't want to go so long in my storm that I don't see the hand of God silence the wind and, and still and, and, and calm and stop the rain. We can be in a season or a storm so long that we get used to being wet. We get used to the downpour. We get, we get used to the bad things happening. And that's, listen, hear me clearly, that's not of God. That's not of God. God's never going to put me through anything that makes me less when it comes to my walk with him. God's never going to put me through anything that pushes me farther away in my relationship with him. In everything that God does, he's bringing me closer. He's bringing you closer. In everything that God does, he wants to build you up. He wants to edify you. He wants to draw you close, not tear you down and push you out. Even in brokenness, I've been broken. It's a good thing to be broken when it's by God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Even in brokenness, God keeps you close because he don't want to lose none of the pieces. He keeps you close. And the reason the potter keeps the pieces close is because he's got a plan for every piece. So let's get into it because we're going to see that Nehemiah and the families have come together and they're rebuilding, they're reconstructing the wall and everything's going great and the enemy shows up in opposition. When the enemy comes up against you, he's, he's hoping you're going to run away from God and back to the world. Let me just make that clear before we get into Scripture today. 
When the enemy comes against you, he's hoping you're going to run away from God and go back to the world, back to your weakness, back to your old lifestyle, when everything felt like it came so much easier. And I'm going to confess this to you. I've been there before. You too, have you? That it's been easy to commit a sin because you already feel like you failed. It's easy to commit a sin because you already feel like you failed. But listen to me. When Satan learns that when the attacks come, rather than run from God, you run deeper into God, rather than fight your battles, you let God fight your battles for you. I don't know about you, but I want the devil, listen to me, I want the devil to always be aware that when he messes with me, he's going to have to deal with my father. I want the devil to know that when he's messing with me, I'm approaching the throne room. I want the devil to know that if he's going to mess with me, he's going to have to deal with God because that's who I'm taking it to. That's who I'm taking it to. Look at your neighbor and say, trust God to do it. Let's get into it. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. If you do not have a Bible, the scripture will be on the screen in just a moment. And if you want a Bible, you see me before you leave and I'll get you one completely free of charge. And it's yours as a gift. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. Opposition to the work. Let's read it, and we're going to swing back around and see what God's word has to do with our life today as well. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. He's taunting them. Verse 2, chapter 4, And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Yes, what they are building concerning the wall, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Now it's personal. Verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads, And give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt. And let not their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Verse 6. So we built the wall. And all the wall was joined together to half its height. For the people. Say it with me. For the people had a mind to work. Nehemiah's enemies, church, they had become angry that the Jews wanted to rebuild the wall. They wanted the Jews to remain weak and exposed. And as long as the walls and the gates were broken down and not repaired, that's exactly what was happening. They had been weakened. They had been exposed. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. The enemy did not take Nehemiah and the Jews seriously. After all, they had tried to rebuild this wall before, and if you remember I shared last week that it just simply did not turn out. Your enemy is still the same today, and this is how the enemy sees it. Listen closely. You can have dreams, goals, visions, as long as you don't trust God and grow in your faith in the process. The enemy will give you that. The enemy does not care if you come to church. The enemy does not care if you come to church every single time the doors are open. As long as you don't begin to get involved and become part of the family. Because involvement and growth does something on the inside of you in your walk with the Lord. So the enemy's okay with your attendance. He's not okay with your involvement. Two completely different things. If you're taking notes, write that down. Attendance and involvement. Two completely different things. Notice the first level of attacks that take place. They're laughing at them. They're jeering them, Scripture says. 
they're mocking them. They make a joke that if a, if a fox were to climb up on there, he'd knock the whole thing down because it's being made of, of ruins. Words of ridicule are oftentimes the enemy's first go-to weapon because it's the easiest to use. It's free. It's the easiest to use. He's hoping it takes very little effort on his part, and he's wanting us to do most of the work. Let me explain that. The enemy tries to plant a seed. You've been there before I have. The enemy tries to plant a seed. He tries to plant a word of fear. He tries to plant a lie. He then hopes we pick it up. So-and-so's talking about you. So-and-so thinks this about you. Oh, they just looked at me a certain way. I know they don't like me. They're judging me. He takes a little seed and he plants it into our minds. We allow it to hit our hearts. And then he's hoping that we do the rest. He's hoping that we run with it from there, turning it into more than it ever should have been turned into. Oh, if you know, you know, the devil is a slippery foe. It's the easiest thing. It's, it's the easiest weapon he's got. Just plant a seed. Step back and let you and I do the work with it. It's the easiest, easiest thing he's got. Tell someone near you, don't pick it up. Tell somebody else, don't pick it up. Let me give you two quick examples. Do you remember when David came down and looked at Goliath? Before Goliath did anything physical, what did he do? He taunted him with his words. Why does David and Goliath come down to see what's going to happen because this whole thing is about fear being instilled into the heart of Israel. Goliath planted seeds, never had to lift a spear. And he let Israel do the rest of the work. And for all that time, they were paralyzed and captivated by a man's words. How easy was it for Goliath that all he had to do was taunt and jeer? The enemy tried to do the same thing with Jesus. Our Lord and Savior. The soldiers mocked him. And then if you remember, when he was on the cross, one thief ends up coming to and, and accepting it. But Scripture does let us know in one of the gospel accounts that at one point, both thieves on the cross were mocking Jesus in the very beginning of that trial in his life. So we see that Satan is even operating against Jesus at this time in the ministry of Christ on earth with words, taunts, jeering him. Now, he may be taunting you, but if the enemy knows you run to God, I promise you this, pay close attention. If the enemy knows you run to God, your enemy is nervous. He's nervous. If that sounds like boasting, then let me boast in my Lord. I love the fact that the devil knows if he's going to come at me, he's going to have to come nervously, not confidently. Because I know who wins at the end of it. And I promise it ain't him. I promise the enemy will not win at the end of it. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, look at what it says. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Write this down. They were committed. Write this down. They had made up their mind. They were committed. They had made up their mind. They had made up their mind to work. They had made up their mind to do the will of God. Nehemiah had given them the plan. That he did. Remember, he said, God's hand is on me. Nehemiah had given them the plan, and nothing was going to stop them from accomplishing the task at hand. See, that's where you got to be in your faith. Nothing's going to stop me. If I'm, if I'm operating in the will of God, I don't care how hard the attack, I know the attack's coming sooner or later, but if I'm operating in the will of God, nothing's going to stop me from accomplishing what God has equipped me to do. Hear that. If it's the will of God, then God has equipped you to do it. Do you agree with that? The Spirit of God living in you, if, if He's equipped you, he's, he's made it, He's made it so that you can accomplish the task in Christ. Nehemiah 4, 7, look at it. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Astadites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going what direction? Forward. Write this down if you're taking notes. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. 
Oh, one of the biggest mistakes in the life of a believer is they stop moving forward. That's dangerous ground. Dangerous ground. Hear me, that's dangerous ground. It says in the seventh verse, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were what, church? They were very angry. See, this is interesting because in the beginning when they saw that the people had just assembled, they were angry. Scripture tells us that. They were angry, but they weren't so angry that they thought that these people were going to be successful. They were just angry because they had gathered in unity. See, write this down. The devil don't like Christians in unity. The devil does not like Christians in one accord. The devil does not like unity in the house of God. So they're angry in the beginning. Matter of fact, if you go back to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, now when Samballat had heard that we were building the wall, Nehemiah's report, he says, he was angry and greatly enraged. But look at what he did at the end of verse 1. All he did was jeer at them. See, he's trying to plant a seed and hope that they do the rest of the work and stop it. Rest of the work in their mind and heart that they're not going to be good enough. They can, you know, that's one of the things that the enemy taunts you with is, 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 is plant a seed that you're not good enough. I've got good news for you. I'm not good enough and neither are you unless Jesus is doing the work inside of us. Can we say amen to that? So the next time the enemy tries to plant a seed and remind you that you're not good enough, go ahead and tell him, you're right. I'm not good enough. But now comes a profession. But my God living on the inside of me is. I'm not good enough to do this, but my Jesus, let me tell you what the devil hates, watch this. But my Jesus, who came down here and you tried to defeat and you couldn't beat him, my Jesus went to the cross for me and he took your power away from you. And the power of God and the anointing of God's Holy Spirit, oh enemy devil, the Spirit of God is stirring up on the inside of me and I'm reminding you today with the word, I'm planting a seed on you you that you can't beat me that, that's how you do it not not oh I just don't feel good enough but it'll be okay it's just a season it's just a season of not feeling good enough it's it's just another chapter it's just a storm of depression it's just a listen I'm not making light of depression and I'm not making light of anxieties but I want to point out and magnify who God is. And I promise he's bigger than your depression. I promise he's greater than your anxiety. I promise he's larger than your fear. I promise that he can deliver you if you're willing to stop holding it. But that takes work. You say, oh my goodness, how could he say that? I don't have to, I can get rid of this depression. Listen, when you know who God is. And when you trust God to pick it up and move the mountain, he will, I promise. See, oftentimes the reason people never get out of their battle with depression is because they're so rooted deeply in it that they never get rid of all of it. They just get rid of chapters of it. They're willing to get rid of this piece and this piece and this piece while they're still knee deep in the rest of the depression. I promise you, God will take you up and set your feet upon a solid rock if you let them. You don't have to stand in depression anymore. You don't have to stand. See, I'm preaching a word of freedom. You've got to be willing to accept freedom. If you want to be caught up in bondages, listen, I love you, but that's your business. But as your shepherd, I want better for you. And I'm telling you that I know a God that delivers. I know a God that heals. I know a God that, that sets people free. And for the people that this is making feel real uncomfortable right now, I love you, but I'm talking to you too. Stop pacifying people and Tell them who your God really is. Tell them who your God really is. Oh, he can walk on water, but I don't know that he can fix depression. Oh, he can part seas, but I don't know about anxiety. I mean, ah, it's the same God in the New Testament today that is in the Old Testament of the past long ago. It's the same God. And what we have to come to grips with as Christians and followers, listen, either God is God or he's not. And I believe that God is sick and tired 
of churches redefining who God is simply because churches get uncomfortable when they pray for somebody and they don't see action right away. I believe God's tired of that nonsense. Either you're going to believe in the entirety of the Bible or you're not. But you and I do not get the right to take pages out. Either he healed the lame and the cripple or he didn't. I say he did. I say he did. If he can rescue people then, he can rescue people now. I say he can. I say he can. If he can restore the minds of people that struggle with demonic forces and he delivered demons out of them, I believe he'll still do it today. See, I believe we need to do a lot more trusting in the Word of God and a lot less trusting in professionals. Especially when the professionals do not profess Christ. The enemy, the enemy sees that at this point, Nehemiah's account is that the wall is up to half his height. So the enemy is saying, uh-oh, they didn't got this far. They're almost finished. And they start to conjure up a plan. The enemy hears that the people are serious about their freedom. And let me tell you, when the enemy finds out that you're serious about your freedom in Christ, you're going to face some opposition. But let me just tell you this. That's not to scare you. That's to help you. It's worth it. It's worth it. Now the enemy is upset, there's, there's nervous laughter, there's, there's nervous taunting, has quickly turned into anger, rage, to the point to where now the enemy has done something different this time. He's plotted together to come fight against Jerusalem, all because the wall is built to half its height. It's been restored to half its height. With that in mind, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 7 for a moment. Let's see what Jesus is saying here in the text. Matthew <clears throat> chapter 7, verse Matthew 7, 24. Let's look at the lesson that Jesus is teaching here. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. Here's the good news, church. But it did not fall. Because, everybody say because. Because. Jesus says it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Jesus is teaching about the foundation of your life. And he is showing the importance, church. He's showing the importance of having your faith in him and trusting God with your soul. But don't miss another point from this lesson that Jesus is teaching here in Scripture. No matter what you believe in, no matter what you believe in, one thing is guaranteed according to the passage. The rain came and the winds blew. If your house is planted firmly and fashioned firmly to the rock, Scripture says the rain came and the wind blew. And if your house is seated on the sand, Scripture says alike the same, still the rain came and the winds blew. 
If you didn't already know, let me warn you this morning in love, sooner or later, I promise you, the rains will come and the winds of life will blow and that rain and that wind is going to beat against you and what matters according to Christ is who you're trusting in. And one thing is for sure, the rain's coming and the wind will be blowing. Now, there may be some overly religious, righteous people that say, in Jesus' name, I'm never getting attacked by the enemy. You're not going to profess that over me in my life and my family. I'm not professing anything. I'm just reading what Jesus says about you. Don't be so arrogant and don't be so cocky and confident that you do not receive or take heed to the warnings of Christ. If you're planted on the rock, or you're buried on the sand and into the sand with your foundation, both of them, both of them get the rain and the wind. See, it's all about this. Write this down if you're taking notes. The rain and the wind are coming. The rain and the wind are coming. And this is what I want you to write down underneath of it or beside it. It's all about my preparation. It's all about my preparation. Look at your neighbor and say, what you going to do about it? It's all about preparation. It's all about preparation. Let me, just, let me just share with you. Write this down. James chapter 1 verse 12. The scripture will be on the screen. You can read along if you like. James chapter 1 12 says this. Uh, let's just read it out loud together on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three, go. Blessed is the man. Stop right there. Blessed is the man that remains what? Steadfast. Stand right. Say steadfast. Remember I just told you, it's all about preparation. It's all about preparation. Read it again from the beginning. Ready? One, two, three, go. Blessed is the man who remains. Stop right there. Steadfast under what? Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to go through stuff. We're going to go through stuff. Don't think that you won't, don't think that you won't see a trial. Back at the beginning, ready, one, two, three, go. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has, stop right there, for when he stood the what? Yeah. And so we're going to be tested. Now let me just make this clear that Jesus makes clear. The word of God lets us know that God will never tempt us because he'll never lead us into sin. But it does say this. He will test us. And so there's a difference. He's not going to tempt us, but he'll test us. And let me just tell you this to get the devil out of the way. He's not going to test you by tempting you. Two completely different things. I look at what it says. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will, say with me, he will receive the crown of, oh, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for that day. I don't know what my crown's going to look like. I don't know what your crown's going to look like. But I do know that Scripture teaches a little bit about the things that we do here on life affect what our crown looks like. Now, you want to know what's so good because we say our treasures are stored in heaven. Amen. 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 Don't, 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 don't get so built up in your head that you just get caught up in doing works because you want your crown to be magnificent. I'm going to have the biggest crown of everybody. You know, like sometimes you ride through the cemetery and you see these people that got eight-foot headstones and you're like, hey, what was that all about? <laughs> 42 font letters showing their last name. And you're like, at this point, Mr. Jones, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> now, if... You have a Jones that has an eight-foot headstone. I completely just made that up. It wasn't personal. <laughs> Here's the beautiful thing about the crown. See, we don't, we don't build our crown, if you will, to edify ourselves. Scripture says that when we get the crown, we're going to cast it at the feet of Jesus. See, I don't even get to wear it long. And I'm okay with that because I could have nothing on that crown. I could have no stone, no gem, no ruby, no diamond, no emerald. I could have nothing on that crown. I wouldn't have the crown itself if it wasn't for the work of God in me. 
And so this is why the work that we're doing in the gifts of the crown that we'll receive, there's going to come a point in eternity where we take that crown and we cast it down at the feet of the one who deserves it most. We are saying, oh Jesus, you are my king. I'm not worthy to wear the crown. You are the king of all kings, Lord of all lords. And anything I got is only because you provided it. It's going to be an amazing moment. Get that verse back up there again. It says, for when he has stood the test. Write this down if you're taking notes. Stand the test. If he had stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Read it with me. Which God has promised to those who love him. Yes. You and I, we got a promise. Romans 12, 12. Jot that down. Romans Romans 12.12 12 says this, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. See that? Still talking about how the rains will come, the wind's going to blow. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. Then what's it say? Be constant in prayer. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Now, 1 Peter, write this down. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 through 11. I want us to read this one out loud again together. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with the 8th verse. Here we go. 1, 2, 3, go, church. Be Stop right there. Tell your neighbor, look out. I'm just going to tell you my honest opinion. One of the biggest reasons we have a government system that we have and the turmoil that it's in is because the church, if they were watching out, they didn't get loud enough for what they were seeing. They didn't remain watchful, and if they were claiming to be vigilant, they weren't praying hard enough, and if they were praying hard enough, they weren't matching it up in their actions. And so prayer removed from school. Trying to pull faith system out of government. And I believe... That in the end time, as God is pouring out his spirit upon his people, we are going to see an uprising of faith that no enemy can contend with. And revival will break loose across the land. Look at the verse again. One, two, three, go. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a seeking. Next verse. Ready? One, two, three, go. Resist him. Firm in you. Next verse. Stop right there. Okay. Now for the people that wanted to rise up against me that like going through your seasons for weeks and months at a time. You know, but there are some people that doom and gloom stuff like that. And, and listen, doom and gloomers, that, that, that's a tool of the enemy there. Don't, don't fall under that cloud. Don't fall under that cloud. You know the thing about storms is the sun's shining just on the other side of them clouds. Yep. <laughs> it may be dark down here. It may be a tornado down here. But if we could pierce through all them clouds, the sun's still shining up there. It's, everybody say it's my choice. my choice. Look at what it says. Get that verse back up. Thank you, brother. And after you have suffered a little while, everybody say little while. Tell your neighbor, it shouldn't take long. Man, when you get that kind of faith, it shouldn't take long. Hey, he may show up my door today. He may come at me today. He may try to plant a seed in here today. He may try to do something against me today. It may take a day. It may take an hour. It may take a couple days for me to work through this thing. But I got a God who speaks. I got a God who loves. I got a God who ministers. And I got a God who at salvation put his Holy Spirit in me. I don't have to go through this thing for so long. Because my God's word says, put it up there. After I've suffered, say it with me, for a Write those two words down, little while, little while. You, you, ever, you, ever, you, ever been, you ever been given a direction of a recipe for somebody? And they say, hey, how much is this? Just a little bit. Everybody's got different directions. Just a dash, just a pinch. Just flick it in there. Just a little brush. 
just a little bit, if we could understand that that little bit helps lead that recipe to perfection. And it's important. Write this down. The little bits are important. You can't skip an ingredient. Amen? If you skip an ingredient thinking you're going to get the same results, it ain't going to taste the same. Christians, we do that, though, don't we? Well, I'll skip this ingredient and expect to see, see the same glory. I'll, ex- I, I, I'll skip this moment and expect to still live closely with the Lord. I'm going to skip a little bit. Listen, when it comes to your attack, you walk in victory when you walk in this knowledge. My God says it's only going to take a little while. Now, you've got to come up with your definition of what a little while is. You know someone in your life, they, they say, I'll be there in just a minute. Fifty minutes later. I'm coming. I'm coming. Just give me a minute. You tell your children, hey, come here. They say, I'm coming. It's been three minutes. I don't hear no foot stepping. Hey, come here. I'm coming. I wonder, I wonder how many times God has called us to do something. And our mind says, I'm coming, but our actions are planting roots. God, you're call- I'll do it, God. I'll do it, God. My heart says, I'll do it, God. But I'm not moving. I'm not moving. You've got to know that your enemy is coming against you. And he's going to want to keep you for a season. He doesn't want you seasoned. But the word of God says, we've just been over it multiple times, and we're going to move on, but multiple times the word of God says that the attack is coming. And then we just see in Scripture that when it shows up, how long is it going to take? Now let's read this, and we're going to move on. Ready? One, two, three, go. And after you have suffered a little while, Leave that verse up there, please. I want you to focus on that. If you're struggling with depression, I want to talk to you because I feel led by the Spirit to not get off of this thing. It's not that I'm undervaluing what you got going on in life. I want you to know what God can do for your life. If you would truly submit and surrender and climb out from under what you got. How many people believe God's Word always works? It says that he will himself restore. Look at your neighbor and say, that's my God. He will himself restore you. He will confirm you. He will strengthen you. And what's it say? Oh, I love the last one too. He will, (laughs) oh my goodness, he'll establish you. Everybody say, that's my God. See, that's not just for everybody except for you. That's you too. Look at your neighbor and say, that's for me. me. Oh, you got to own that. You got to own that. That's my God. That's for me. And when the enemy comes to attack you, you remind that slippery old fool of a devil, hey, this ain't going to last long. I'm not wrestling with you. I'm giving you over to my father. I'm going, I'm going to tell my father. You ever had that friend growing up? I'm going to tell my mom. (laughs) See, I think one thing that Christians, we need to do more is run to God more. Stop trying to do it ourselves. Stop trying to reason it ourselves. Listen, our God says he'll confirm you. He'll establish you. Let him do it. Write this down if you're taking notes. Let God be God. Oh, just let God be God. When the attack shows up, you you know you're doing something right. Amen. When the attack of the enemy shows up, you know you're doing something right, and the enemy's gone from being nervous to angry. Nehemiah knew he was doing something right, brothers and sisters, when, when the enemy went from just being nervous and angry to now being raging in their efforts in anger. There's a reason they do it. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 8. Let me teach you this attack of, of, of the devil. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 8. Watch, watch this. It's really plain to see in Scripture. Isn't that so good that God's Word is just there for us to learn 
everything we need. Amen? Nehemiah chapter 4, look at verse 8. So the enemy, they get angry because they see that the wall, verse 7 says, the work is going forward. So verse 8, the end, it's speaking of the enemy, verse 8, and they all plotted together to come, pay attention, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, read that with me, and to cause confusion in it. In their plotting, take note to what their goal is. They've got one goal. They want to come fight. Not, not, not to kill them and get rid of them. Look at what it says. They want to come fight to cause confusion in the land. How many people know that the devil still operates under that tool today? Oh, oh, just to cause confusion. You see, where there's confusion, there's no unity. There's a lack of, severely, a lack of loyalty. When there's confusion and people don't know what to do, where to go, how to do it, how to go about it, preparation that needs to take place. So when they're plotting, their, their desire is to cause confusion. Listen to me, church. That's what the enemy does. He causes confusion. Write this down. 1 Corinthians 14.33. In 1 Corinthians 14.33, we see Paul writing this to the church. 1 Corinthians 14.33. For God is not a God of confusion. Can we say amen to that? I'm so glad that he makes it simple. For God is not a God of confusion, but of what? Peace. Write this down, confusion, then write the word peace, and I want you to circle peace. He says, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So the enemy, the enemy looks to plant seeds of confusion to try and attack and remove your peace. Do you see that? Paul says he's not a God of confusion, he's a God of peace. And so what the enemy wants to do is instill confusion, insert confusion to take away peace. So again, the enemy looks to plant seeds of confusion. And then he hopes that we're willing to do the dirty work and fertilize that seed, water that seed, and believe that seed, that lie of his. Nehemiah 4, 8. Let's go deeper. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we are come among them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So, in the lower parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When the attack of confusion came, Nehemiah and the people prayed for clarity. The enemy opposes the work. There is a very real threat of an attack. Some of the Jews who were not building make their way up to the project of the wall and the gates and they come up to their fellow Jews and they try to convince them to stop building. You ever had a friend when you tell them about what Jesus has done in your life and they say, oh no, you're not going to become one of those religious fanatics, are you? You're, you're not, you're not going to go out there and join those people, are you? Their own blood comes up to them and says, stop the work. Scripture emphasizes it, how big of a deal it was. It says ten times they tried to tell them, stop the work. I'm telling you that when you step out in faith and you do what God has called you to do, the attacks come from all angles. Everybody say, look out. The attacks are going to come and can come and will come from all angles. Nehemiah's response, I love it. The enemy says stuff. Their, their family and friends are saying stuff. 
But Nehemiah's response there in the text is amazing. This is what Nehemiah says to the workers. He says, do not be afraid of them. And then he says this. Everybody say remember. (laughs) He says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. I think as Christians, it would do us a great justice is if when we pray and when we live our lives, we remember God and that our Father is great and He is awesome. Write this down. I've got three steps to give you. I've got three steps to give you and then we're going to we're going to get ready to close and, and have a time of prayer together. I got three steps. Step one. Write that down. Step one. Do not be afraid of an enemy who's already been defeated. Step one. Do not be afraid of an enemy who's already been defeated, rendered powerless. The Bible says this. If you're looking for the exact terminology, the Bible says that the enemy has been disarmed. See, an enemy that's been disarmed, they can't, they can't do much damage to you. He'll try to plant a seed and hope that you do the dirty work. So step one, do not be afraid of an enemy who's already been defeated. Step two, here we go, step two. Always remember God is great and awesome. We'll take that from the words, the mouth of Nehemiah. Step two, always remember that my God is great and awesome. Step three, you ready for step three? Here it comes. Step three, repeat steps one and two. Everybody say, that's it. That's it. Step one, do not be afraid of an enemy who's already been defeated. Step two, always remember that God is great and awesome. Step three, repeat step one and two. And if you do that this week, I promise, you'll do real well. (laughs) You'll do real well. We're going to close with the reading of this next passage, uh, this next part of the passage in Nehemiah 4, 15 and 23. I want you to go ahead and look at it. And it is going to be the conclusion of this particular chapter here in Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah 4, 15 says this. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan. Oh, can you say amen to that? Everybody say a little while. That's it. The enemy frustrated the plan, man. Oh, that's so good. The enemy, the enemy thought that they were going to frustrate the plan of God. God frustrated the enemy's plan. It's so good. The enemy comes in to spoil the plan of God. Have you recognized that? The enemy comes in to spoil the plan of God. And here's the thing. They think they did. But let me just encourage you in love. You can't outsmart God. And you can't outrun them either. And maybe there's some people here today that you think you're outsmarting God because you're playing games with them. And maybe there's some people here that you think you're outrunning God because you keep trying to avoid them and you keep putting them off and you keep putting them off and you keep putting them off. But the grace of God is so great that he's allowed you to be here again today for another chance to surrender. And the Bible, the Bible tells us this, that verse 15, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Oh, they got back to work. But look at their preparation. Remember I told you earlier, it's all about the preparation. Verse 16, from that day on, half my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coat of mail. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other hand. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side when he built. And the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, The work is great and widely spread, and we are separated on the wall, far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, and our God will fight for us. 
Look at your neighbor say, let your father do it. Oh, remember earlier I told you there's so much peace in this room? Because, let me tell you why. Because I believe that my father was going to do the service today. Just let, let my father do it. I don't want to touch it. I want the spirit of my father to touch it. I don't want to motivate you. I want the Holy Spirit of God to motivate you. See, all I'm able to do is move your ears. Tickle your ears. But if the Holy Spirit anoints what he gives me to tell you, and his spirit is moving on the inside of you, then he can take what you receive and the spirit that's in you while you leave. See, I don't get to go home with you. Can you say amen to that? The spirit goes with you if you're saved. And he's ministering to you if you let him everything that you've heard today. Everything that you've heard today. <laughs> so he says, our God's going to fight for us. Look at verse 21. So we labored at the work. Oh, I love that. They, did, they didn't stop serving when it got hard. So we labored at the work and, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem that they may be a guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. God frustrated the enemy's plan. Let's stand and pray together, shall we? If you're in here and you know you believe God's got something for your life and you just don't know what it is. You believe God's got a plan and you just, you're just having a hard time seeing it. And you just want to ask God for clarity. I'm going to invite you to come forward and as I close in prayer, I'm going to pray over you. If you know that you know that you want to serve the Lord and you just don't know how, I, I invite you to come forward. If there's anyone in this room that's struggling, that's struggling with doing the work of the Lord, I'm going to invite you to come forward at this time. You can come on up. And let me just say this. If there's anyone, if there's anyone that feels like the enemy has been pressing and attacking, I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you. And if there's anyone in this room if there's anyone in this room that says, God, I just want to know that I know that you're God and you can triumph over any and every problem I got, then I am just crazy enough in my faith to say, God will do it. God will do it. And let me just ask you this. And I'm going to pray for these people, but let me ask you this. Are you here this morning and you feel that you're saved, but you just don't know what to do? Before I pray for these people, I want to pray for you specifically. Because like I told you earlier, the enemy doesn't care that you're here. He gets a little nervous. He gets a little nervous, but he ain't angry yet. But you surrender completely to the Lord. Listen, that's when you know you're doing something. Because if you're willing to go to work for the kingdom of God, God's going to show you what he wants you to do. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for that person in here today that feels like they just don't know. They feel saved. They believe they're saved. But they just don't know what's next father I pray in the name and in the blood of Jesus father that you would minister to them father that you would encourage them that you would make their feet steadfast father Lord that you would create a boldness in their life that only your Holy Spirit can produce father I, I lift up to you these brothers and sisters that have come up this morning on both sides of the stage 
And I pray, Father, that they receive the answers that they're looking for. Father, I pray that your voice would speak to their heart loud and clear. Father, that there would be such clarity that they know that they know that you are providing for their need in their life. Whatever question they have, whatever desire they have, whatever you've placed upon their heart today, Father, may they see you as Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, first and last. May they let no one get in between. If there's anyone in this room that has not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to tell you, and I promise you this, it'll be the best decision you ever make. You've been spinning your wheels. You feel like you're stuck in a rut. You make it a little ways only to find yourself right back where you started. Replacing one pleasure with another pleasure because the pleasures are constantly fleeting and running from you. See, here's the great thing about a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to go run down the peace and joy of the world when you accept Jesus into your life. Jesus becomes your peace. Jesus becomes your joy. Jesus becomes the love that you need. And he shows up with all of it. And you don't have to beg him for it. He died to give it to you. So if you're in here today and, and you've, you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it would be foolish of me not to give you the opportunity. We've already had one young man come to Christ before church even started. Is there anyone else in this room that says, hey, pastor, I want to choose Christ? And if that's you, I want you to raise your hand high enough because I don't want to miss you. Leave it up until I see it. Is there anyone in this room that says, I need to choose Christ? in my life right now and I want to remind you that you're worth it I want to remind you that you're loved and I want to remind you that Jesus laid it down for you and if you've got questions I will be here today and I will talk to you and we got other people that will be here and they'll talk to you Ed and Renee if you'll come up front they'll be here and they'd love to talk to you Father, as your people go forward today, I pray that they would remember and consider the things that they've heard today. Father, that we would just allow your word to marinate in our lives. That we would remember to faithfully go before you in prayer all throughout this day. And we would understand, Father, that we're needed here. We're loved here. And we can be used here because we're a family here. Father, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. Somebody told me a couple of weeks ago, they said, you know, your, your church is too big. I, I can't attend your church. And, I can't attend a room full of so many people and you're building a bigger sanctuary. That's not going to feel like family at all. <laughs> oh my goodness. I hope they don't have that view about heaven. Because I promise you, eternity will be much larger than this property ever will be. And there will be more people from more walks of life in eternity than could ever fit in this building or the building behind here that we're building. Don't believe a lie from the devil that the family of God that you're in should not grow larger than a certain number because I'm going to tell you this a million people if they all came along with one purpose one vision one mind if a million people serve God and one another shoulder to shoulder they could be tighter than a dying family of 50 that has confusion and division on the inside of its walls don't listen to a lie from the enemy you cannot think, you cannot ever think that family is defined by your size. But I believe that family is defined by your love for God. I believe that family is defined by your love for one another. I believe that family is defined that we go into the community and we pull more people in so that they can hear that there is a Jesus that came for 
for them, lived for them, died for them, rose for them, and is coming back to get them. I believe that family is defined by our service towards one another and your devotion towards one another, not by your side. Father, you do what only you can do. And we surrender to that work. And I pray that you would continue to strengthen us with your Holy Spirit's power. And you would continue to teach us by your spirit, as your word says. Your spirit will teach us all things. And I pray, God, that today when we walk through those doors, we are experiencing freedom. And I pray that we all leave here stronger, more encouraged, more refreshed, and better than we were when we showed up. And it's all because of you. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody, everybody said together, amen and amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. Hallelujah.